Hi everyone, welcome back to 3 News Now. I'm Stephanie Haney. It's Thursday, January 21st. Thanks for being here to get filled in with your top stories from WKYC.com and our WKYC app. We start with bringing an update to what President Joe Biden has done so far with his first 24 hours in office. Late, the, one of his latest actions was signing an executive order to extend the eviction moratorium. This will be extended through at least the end of March. And it was originally expect, expected to expire set to expire rather at the end of January on January 31st but now people will be able to stay in their homes if they can't afford their monthly bills through at least the end of March before eviction and foreclosure proceedings can begin. Now this is something that's impacting a lot of Americans because almost 12 percent of homeowners with mortgages are late on their payments right now and 19 percent of renters are behind in their payments. That's according to a Census Bureau survey of households. Other things that President Biden has already done, he has stopped the constru construction of a border wall along the U.S.-Mexico border. And he's also ended the travel ban from some Muslim-majority countries. He has also said that he intends to rejoin the Paris Climate Accord and the World Health Organization. Another thing that he has done, revoked approval of the Keystone XL oil pipeline and also revised the previous administration's census plan. And now, under the current plan, under President Biden, undocumented immigrants will be counted in the 2020 census, whereas previously that was not the plan under former President Trump's administration. Another thing President Biden has done, he has required masks in federal buildings and federal lands, as well as certain instances of travel that cross state lines. This includes airports and planes, ships, inner city buses, trains, and public transportation. And another thing pertaining to travel, travelers from abroad will have to produce a negative COVID-19 test before they can depart for the U.S., and they will be required to quarantine upon arrival, that taking effect in just a matter of days. Now, today, President Biden talked about his COVID-19 response, and he plans to sign 10 pandemic-related executive orders today. Some of the things we can expect to see from the president, he said that he will not be following through on the Trump administration's plan to penalize states that are lagging in vaccination by shifting some of those allocations to more efficient states. President Biden said that we are not looking to pit one state against another as we figure out how to most efficiently roll out the COVID-19 vaccine across the U.S. President Biden said his goal is to have most kindergarten through grade eight schools reopen in the first 100 days of his administration. And he is ordering the Departments of Education and Health and Human Services to provide clear guidance for reopening schools safely. States would also be able to tap into FEMA's disaster relief fund to help them get schools back open, providing a resource for funding that wasn't previously available. President Biden is also speaking, seeking to expand testing and vaccine availability. His goal is 100 million vaccine shots in the first 100 days in office. Now, some experts, though, say that the bar should be set higher than 100 million shots in the first 100 days in office. Now, that's a massive increase already in what we've seen in the past 30 days since the COVID-19 vaccine first became available here in the U.S. But according to experts, during the flu season, the U.S. can vaccinate about 3 million people a day. That's according to Dr. Christopher Murray of the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation in Seattle. So Dr. Murray says, given the number of people who are dying from COVID, that we could and should do more like what we're able to do with the seasonal flu. Of course, there are a lot of factors that go into play there when it comes to manufacturing and distribution. And when it comes to the transporting of the COVID-19 vaccine, we saw a major problem here in Ohio. Almost 900 doses of the COVID-19 vaccine may have been spoiled here in Ohio. This is part of a larger group of 17,000 doses spoiled across Maine and Michigan and also Ohio. So yesterday, Ohio State Department of Health found 890 doses of the Moderna vaccine were not properly stored. So because of a result of that, the Ohio State has, has suspended ties with a company called Specialty RX, which is the company that had handled the drug. Now, those 890 doses 
Those were to be the second dose. Remember, this is a two-dose vaccine for residents in eight local long-term care facilities. So that was heading to the people who were part of the Phase 1A rollout here in Ohio. Those uh, locations were in Berea, East Cleveland, Cleveland, North Randall, Waterville, Clyde, and Kent and Euclid. So need to figure out what will happen with those second doses there. Now, those future doses will likely be filled by another provider and distributed through the local health departments there. Now, this is important to note. There have been no reports of anyone in those three states, in Maine, Michigan, or here in Ohio, who were injected with a compromised vaccine. But when resources are so scarce, obviously, you hate to hear about total of 17,000 and 900 here in Ohio that can't be used because they simply weren't stored properly because these vaccines are very temperature sensitive. If they're not stored properly, they can't be used. Now let's take a look at the latest numbers for COVID-19 from the Ohio Department of Health out just now. We've seen a uptick in new cases. That number in the last 24 hours, 7,271. The daily positive rate has gone down, though. The latest data we have is from Tuesday, and 9.2% of those COVID-19 tests came back positive on Tuesday. The seven-day average is staying steady at 10% right now. We have seen more deaths reported in the last 24 hours. That number is up to 109 new people who have been reported to have died related to COVID-19 in Ohio. Also, 306 new hospitalizations in the last 24 hours. That number is up, but the total number of people in the hospital is down. 3,406 people are now being treated in a hospital for COVID-19, and out of those people, 845 of them are being treated in an ICU. That is also down from yesterday. But up from yesterday, 35 new ICU admissions in the last 24 hours. And right now, about 27% of hospital beds in the state are available for people who need to be treated for anything in an inpatient capacity. Now let's take a look at the national and the global numbers for COVID-19. These numbers come from Johns Hopkins University. Across the U.S., the total number of cases is now at 24,502,349. The total number of deaths across the U.S. is now at 407,653. And with 4% of the global population, the U.S. has the most cases at 25.2% of the cases around the globe. And this number up a tenth of a percentage point again today, 19.6% of the COVID-19 deaths. Globally, we are now over 97 million COVID-19 cases reported, that number 97,151,318. And the total number of deaths globally is now at 2,082,605. Switching gears now, let's take a look back at the events that happened yesterday at the inauguration in the Capitol. And there is an Ohio tie to a piece of art that will be hanging in Washington, D.C. Dr. Bill, uh, excuse me, Dr. Jill Biden chose a Civil War era painting by a black artist, a Civil War era black artist from Cincinnati to take part in the Capitol Rotunda gift giving ceremony. Now, this is something that is tradition that happens at each inauguration. And she helped Senator Roy Blunt to choose a gift for the Capitol Rotunda gift giving ceremony and just so happened to have those Ohio roots. The painting is called Landscape with Rainbows, and it was done by the famous black artist and painter Robert S. Duncanson, based out of Cincinnati during the 1800s. Now, Senator Blunt described him as the best-known African-American painter during the years of the Civil War, and it was donated for the day by the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Dr. Jill Biden said she chose the painting because she liked what the rainbow seemed to represent being good things to follow. Senator Blunt agreed with that. He said, let's certainly hope so. Now, the fashion from the inauguration definitely got a lot of attention and it extended into the evening. Dr. Biden's inauguration night outfit had a subtle nod in it to unity. She wore a formal coat and a dress and they were inspired by... A message of unity that's according to the designer she wore an ivory coat and a wool dress with embroidery that had all of the state flowers of the united states and territories and the district of columbia it was created by her friend and designer gabriella hurst now the state flowers were embroidered onto the lady's coat and the silk neckline and arms of the dress each flower individually took about two hours to apply to the outfit and then inside the coat, the designer said there was a quote from Benjamin Franklin that represents Dr. Biden's lifelong calling and service as an educator. The quote is, 
Tell me and I forget. Teach me and I remember. Involve me and I learn. Beautiful message there. More symbolism, though, around the fashion of Inauguration Day. You might have noticed there were a lot of people wearing shades of purple. That includes our new Vice President, Kamala Harris, former First Lady Michelle Obama, former Secretary of State, and former Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton, and also Senator Elizabeth Warren. They all had pops of purple on at different points throughout the day. So you might be wondering, what does that have to do with anything? Well, purple is associated not only with the women's suffrage movement, but a lot of people made the connection that purple is the color you get when you mix red and blue. Red, of course, being the color normally associated with the Republican Party, blue being the color normally associated with the Democratic Party. You bring that together and you get purple. And the theme of the inauguration was unity and bringing people together. So a little nod to unity there. And of course, if you were paying attention online yesterday, you noticed that one senator, Bernie Sanders, might not have been wearing purple, but he did get a lot of people's attention. He became a fast spreading internet meme because he was all bundled up. He had his mittens on, his jacket, and uh, people have been popping Bernie Sanders up all over, photoshopping him into things. Here's something that's pretty cool. He's actually uh, been turned into a bobblehead. So you can get your Bernie Sanders inauguration bobblehead if you would like to. And a student from New York University created this app. If you don't have Photoshop, if you're not so great with the photo editing, you can put Bernie Sanders anywhere you want to using Google Street View. I tweeted that link out and we also have it up on WKYC.com. You can find it on my Twitter page at underscore Stephanie Haney. It's absolutely hilarious. You're going to want to make sure you turn into the five o'clock show too, by the way, to see where Bernie Sanders pops up. Here in Cleveland. Uh, two more things to let you know before we go. Former Browns head coach Hugh Jackson is apparently interviewing for the Steelers offensive coordinator job. Now Hugh Jackson has been out of the NFL coaching game for the past two seasons and now according to ESPN's Diana Russini the Steelers have interviewed him for their offensive coordinator position. Apparently the Steelers opted not to keep offensive coordinator Randy Feichner after losing to the Browns in the AFC wild card round of the playoffs this year remember that 48 to 37 we were all there that was a sight to see well now they're potentially looking at Hugh Jackson and remember he was our head coach here in Cleveland for the 2016 season when he was here in Cleveland as head coach the Browns had three wins 36 losses and one tie and then he was fired halfway through the 2018 season before he went back to the Cincinnati Bengals as an assistant coach for the remainder of that season so really moving his way around the AFC if he ends up landing with the Pittsburgh Steelers one more fun fact from Hugh Jackson's time here in Cleveland from 2016 to 2017 Cleveland had one win and 31 losses and had the NFL's second ever 0-16 perfectly losing season in 2017 we'll see what happens with the Steelers and Hugh Jackson and to let you go here let's end it on a high note Cleveland Browns head coach Kevin Stefanski our current head coach who had a much better showing finishing the regular season with 11 wins and five losses has been named the professional football writers of America coach of the year for 2020 and he took us to the postseason for the first time in 17 years, winning the first playoff game since 1994, again since the Browns beat the Steelers 48-37 to in the AFC wildcard round. Can't say that enough, can we? That feels good to say. And he was also named the Sporting News' Coach of the Year. Now that is an honor that is voted on by the NFL's coaches. So congratulations to head coach Kevin Stefanski. That's it for your three news now update for Thursday, January 21st. I'll see you next up on What's New at 5 p.m. with your trending stories. Make sure you watch that to see where Bernie Sanders pops up. Just maybe all around Cleveland. Who knows? And you can watch that live in the WKYC app, by the way. So if you don't yet have the WKYC app, make sure you download that. You can download that for free in the Apple Play Store and the Google App Store. All right, everyone, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Stay safe and be well, and I'll see you back here tomorrow. I'm Stephanie Haney.